Watch this video till the very end to find out how you can win a completely free one-on-one -on -one chess lesson with me. But first, let me share with you this insane game that I have played with black pieces against Gotham Chessbot on chess.com. And of course, to beat Gotham Chess, I needed to sacrifice my rook. So, let's get started. Hi guys, welcome to the Journey to Grandmaster channel and I want to show you this insane game which I have played as Black against Gotham chessboard. Let's see what happened here because yeah, this game is incredible. e4, d6, d4, knight f6, knight f3, e5. Now I play this Philidor defense which yeah, that's basically the start position of the, this opening and I really like it. I recommend it to you because I have played an incredible amount of tournament games as black starting from this position. I have played a lot of blitz games and it's always great because it's incredibly flexible. You don't need to know a lot of theory to be able to play it and it doesn't really matter except uh, in, in terms of the level, like if you are playing against a beginner or if you are playing against the top grandmaster, basically the first like 15 moves are almost the same. Well, except for the fact that your opponent is just start to blunder all of the pieces, your like structure, your development is always follow the same pattern. So it's an incredibly flexible opening. And uh, one of the main lines here for White is to take and go into this end game, which is what happened. The main line here is though knight to f3 and well still leaving the queens on the board a little bit like the most active line. But Gotham wanted to get this endgame and yeah, a lot of slightly low uh, rated players are going to this endgame end with me because they are saying like, okay, I can never lose such an endgame. It's all, uh, so active for me. The skin has no right to castle. And well, maybe I even get a chance to play for a win. But most of the times it, it's not what's happening because those players are not really understanding how to play this endgame. And that is what uh, gives me a chance to outplay them. So Gotham played here knight f3, attacking this pawn on e5, and uh, I played bishop d6, uh, developing my bishop and making sure that this pawn is protected. And this, uh, this move is better than knight b to d7. The reason is very simple. Um, if he plays bishop c4 now, uh, which is also one of the main moves here, there is bishop to c4 immediately, there is bishop to g5 immediately, preparing the long castles, but knight f3 is also one of the possible line. And the difference is, if I play knight b to d7, he can play still bishop c4, of course, and then he's attacking my pawn on f7, and I don't have an opportunity to play king e7, because it's gonna block my own bishop, and yeah, that would just block my entire development, basically. But if I play bishop d6 first, then after bishop uh, to c4, there is nothing stopping me from playing king e7 and protecting this pawn on f7. And also my rook is free to go. And the knight is, of course, can still be developed later on. So bishop d6 is much more flexible. And instead of bishop e uh, c4, which is, yeah, seems like the most active move, he suddenly plays bishop e2, which is, of course, playable. It's more flexible, like just leaving some active opportunities for the future. And King went to e7 still. I'm continuing my plan. I'm trying to develop my pieces because, of course, I'm slightly behind in the development. I have sp spent some time on this uh, King maneuvering to d8 to e7. Bishop e3 also seems like not the most active move because he could have placed the bishop on g5 as a threat of knight d5. But Gotham actually is a very, very tricky player. He tries to uh, leave this square for the knight, which was actually a very important factor uh, later on in the game. So make sure to watch till this moment because it really made a huge difference. And also this bishop in e3 looks like it does nothing here, but it keeps an eye on this c5 square. And oftentimes in this field of defense, black is trying to put some pieces on c5. And usually it's the knight. The knight on c5 is great because it's creating some counterplay. But with a bishop in e3 for the time being, it's not really possible for me to do that. Because once I land on c5, he just exchanges it and then my pawn on e5 is going to be lost. Oops. My pawn on e5 is going to be lost here. So that makes my development much more difficult because also if I 
put my knight on g7 and can go to c5, then my bishop is blocked and I can continue. So bishop a3 is actually a very, very tricky move. Knight went to d7 and yeah, like I said, well, I have to play knight d7. I never want to uh, play knight c6 because yeah, it seems like it's a more active move, but the drawback is it, uh, now I can't cover those d5 and b5 squares. And it's very, very important in the Philidor defense to make sure that this knight is useless. So to do that, I have to play c6. So I, this square is needed for my pawn and the knight has to go to d7. But the drawback is clear. It blocks the bishop here, it blocks the d file, but in the long term it wants to go to c5, which would be a beautiful square for the knight. He made castles, and now I played c6, like I said, well, one of the main ideas of this entire opening is to play against this knight, and a lot of uh, lower, lower rated players as white don't really recognize this point, and then till the end of the day this knight stays on c3 and they don't really understand what to do with it. Because, well, like I said, except for the fact that it defends the pawn, pretty much useless. So he played rook d1. Well, of course, white is more active here. There is no question about it. Uh, white is practically almost finished the development, while I still need a lot of time to somehow get away to develop all of my pieces. And so I wanted to, to be active, I wanted to get some space, so I played this move b5, which is another very typical idea uh, in the Philidor defense, and now maybe you understand one of the Gotham chess ideas when he played not bishop to c4, but bishop to e2. Because usually the black's idea is to play b5 with a tempo, attacking this bishop, and yeah, just winning some time for, for the future development. But right now I still needed to play b5, it still seems like a good opportunity for me, but his bishop is on, already on e2, so he doesn't spend any uh, time on that. He played a3 because, well, I basically created a threat of b4, and then the pawn on e4 would be vulnerable, and I'm gonna pick it up. So he played a3, trying to stop it, and I actually needed to play a5, the best move here, uh, trying to once again create this threat of b4. Instead, I wanted to be even more active and play the move knight g4. It seemed like a very interesting opportunity, and it really is. Uh, like, I was anticipating bishop to g5 check, then I give, I just play f6, and if the bishop goes away, then I always have this maneuver back once he attacks me, knight to h6 and knight to f7. Like, for example, I can start with a5, and once, well, for example, the engine su suggests here the move knight to e1, I can go back to h6, the pawn might go to g5 one day to stop the f4 idea, and the knight is very good on f7, protecting this bishop on d6, and making sure that nothing uh, dangerous happens on the king side. Yeah, but that's uh, at all not what happened, because instead of bishop g5, he played here knight to g5, which, is, which was a complete surprise for me, and suddenly he creates so many threats for me because, well, the drawback of the move uh, c6 is that the bishop is not protected by the move, uh, by, by the pawn anymore. And so it's only my king who protects the bishop and that is why I played king e7 in the very beginning, trying to stabilize the position in the center. But now the king is a little bit overloaded because it has to defend the bishop and it has to defend the pawn. And it can't really uh, deal with both simultaneously. So the threat is uh, knight takes f7, king takes f7, and rook d6. And in some variations, even starting with rook takes d6 and king takes d6, now knight f7 check, and then knight to h8. And also my bishop is hanging. So my idea was, of course, to take the bishop, and that's what I did, but the problem is now the rook is also incredibly active here along the f-file. And yeah, that is what I didn't like a lot. And also knight f6 seems to be a way to deal with it, but actually it doesn't help because still all of the threats are there, knight takes f7 and I'm losing a pawn and the position is horrible. So the right move is f6 and I found it. And the point now is that all of the pawns are stable. He still has knight f7 unfortunately and I have to take it, but otherwise, well, I'm still stabilizing the position. Try to maybe pause this video for a second to find the best move for black because there is only one move here not to get into trouble. Okay, so the right move, unfortunately I have played it, is knight to b8. It seems to be very passive, but it's the only way to defend uh, the pawn on c6. And now if you look at black pieces, 
all of them are on the back rank. It's an incredible position here because White's, for example, after this move, Rook F to D1, White's position seems to be like incredibly active here. And you're gonna be totally surprised, I guess, totally shocked, but this position is better for Black. Isn't that amazing? That is the point of this whole field or defense. It seems like White is much, much better, but objectively it's not. And in this position, for example, after King e7, the engine says it's uh, minus 0.6 for black, which is yeah, quite a pleasant advantage. Unfortunately, I haven't played King to e7. I played Rook e8. My problem with King to e7 was I thought that Bishop takes b5 is a, is a huge combination here because after takes, white has knight d5, and one, once my king goes away, knight to c7, winning the exchange here, and what's even worse, after bishop b7, Knight takes, bishop takes, and rook d8. And after the, queen sec uh, the rook's exchange, I'm gonna lose one of my pieces and, of course, the game. But what I blundered here is the fact that right now the rooks are connected here. But after knight d5, the rooks are not connected anymore, and so I can just pick this rook up. In the variations, I haven't seen it, and that's why I was afraid to play king e7, which is, of course, a mistake. I played rook e8, but it it's not just as good, it's much more passive, and that's what gives uh, white, the, uh, white the advantage again. He played a4 and to begin with I wanted to play a6, that's the most obvious move, but then I was starting to uh, think about this b4 line and it seemed to me like it's the most active move and I should go for it. The drawback is clear, I allow this c4 uh, check for my opponent and this c4 is beautiful for white pieces, but um, I get some time because, well, I'm making this move with a tempo, so I get some time for my development and that was the most important thing for me. Of course, I think he needed to give it this check and now controlling this diagonal, uh, you know, get some activity. Instead, he played knight a2 first, I played a5, and here he also uh, had this opportunity to play, oops, to play bishop c4 with a check, but he decided to play knight c1 with an idea to relocate this knight, I suppose, all the way to c5, where the knight would be just a monster, not allowing uh, black to breathe, basically. And I played here bishop e6, so he didn't use his chance to play bishop c4, and now I'm controlling this whole diagonal, and I felt like, well, it shouldn't be that dangerous. He played knight b3, and threatening this move uh, knight to c5, and I just couldn't believe I can live with such a knight on c5 because then my knight has no moves to go, everything is covered and yeah, that is definitely not what I wanted to see on the board but the agent says I actually have this move king to e7 here and after knight c5 I have an amazing opportunity once again using the fact that this rook is on d6 namely the move bishop to d5 and now all of a sudden the rook is um, hanging and white needs either to play knight b7 which feels a little bit artificial, but also a completely possible line, and then, uh, yeah, I probably have to go back, but it's not clear whether white has something better than just going back to c5. Or he should take on d5 with the rook, probably, not with the pawn, and then uh, get to this position where white is an exchange down, but the activity is huge, and to be honest, I'm not a big fan of this, but yeah, it's, it's playable, like I can play knight d7, d6, king goes to d8, knight a6, and then, well, rook to c8, let's say. And still white is more active, but you can play this position as black. Instead, I played the move here, bishop takes b3, so I just wanted to eliminate this knight, also a possible line, and I thought, well, I'm defending here, so when you're on the defensive side, you should try to exchange as many pieces as possible, if you are not some material down, I mean, if your opponent has the initiative, you should try to exchange as many pieces as possible to reduce his attacking chances because if he has like 10 attacking pieces of course he has so many opportunities to uh, create some dangerous threats for, for you but if he has only three attacking pieces like it is the case here then it's much simpler for you to deal with it also if you have some uh, lack of space in the position also the more pieces you trade the more uh, the more space you get so he took it back. Of course, the drawback once again is that now this bishop is free to go to c4, but I'm, I wasn't really that afraid of this check because I go to e7 and in case of this check, I go to f8 and it seems like everything is covered and I also have this d7 square for my pieces. 
So instead he played king f2, trying to bring the king closer to the center, because remember in the end game, uh, king becomes a very important piece. King f7, I also brought my king to the center, now sidestepping all of the checks and yeah, preparing some rook d7 or knight d7 ideas trying to, you know, maybe exchange a little bit more pieces and uh, develop, finish in my development. He played bishop g4, which is actually very annoying because it stops all of the ideas, but I played rook c7 here. I'm defending the pawn on c6. I couldn't have uh, developed my knight previously because it has to, to protect this pawn. Now I'm protecting it with my rook, and so the knight is free to go to a6. He played h3, which feels a little bit slow, to be honest. And now knight went to a6. Finally, I'm developing my pieces and basically I'm finishing my development and this knight is coming to c5, which is just a perfect square for this knight because it uh, covers all of the squares in the defense and it also attacks and creates some threats uh, there. So c5 in the Philidor defense is almost always, almost in all of the variations, is just a perfect square for this knight. So that is what you aim uh, to, you aim for, sorry. So he played rook d7, the drawback of the move knight to a6 is of course that this d7 square is not covered anymore, so Gotham tried to use it, but of course, well, once again, it's another exchange and the more pieces are getting off the board, the more um, free I feel myself because, well, now I'm not that passive, still, of course, his rook is much more active than mine and he played rook a7, and well knight c5 is basically the only way but i was yeah pretty happy with my position because finally i got this knight to be active i have like if he takes my pawn i have a chance to take his pawn at least one of them and then yeah finally i don't really feel any pressure he played this move bishop d7 now offering me a choice either i go into this rook sand game and exchange it and well hope that as you know all of the rooks end game are a draw in fact, it's not, of course, but it's just uh, a saying. Uh, but, well, this rook and game I don't particularly like because my rook is much more passive. I have a lot of uh, slow, um, a lot of weak pawns there on a5, on c6, so my king is still cut and very passive. So I didn't really want to go into this endgame exchanging my best piece, my most active piece, which is this knight on c5. So I played rook d8 instead, and now not only my knight is active, but my rook is finally getting uh, some activity. He took on c6 and I immediately use this chance. I guess it's not that great to take the pawn uh, because my knight is going a little bit uh, off uh, the main actions. Instead I played rook d to activate in my, my rook and finally I'm just as active as my opponent. And I still have a chance to get one of his pawns of course. So here I took the knight on b3. Uh, sorry, the pawn on b3 with my knight. And of course, it also defends the pawn on a5. And my plan is to eliminate this pawn on b2 and then step by step promote my b pawn. And of course, he has some ideas against this king because the king is very vulnerable. So he plays bishop d5, trying to use it immediately, preparing some active ideas here. I played rook takes b2, continuing my plan. Now, if you exchange, well, definitely black is out of the danger because. Seems like in the, in the end of the day, black will have an extra pawn here. And well, that's definitely nothing to worry about. But instead he played rook f7, which is the most active move. And I can't go to g8 because that would allow some discovered checks and actually a checkmate here after rook takes f6, king h8 and rook f8 checkmate. So the only move is king to e8. So try to never go to the corner in the end game because it's very vulnerable and you might get into trouble and especially don't allow uh, your opponent to give any discovered checks. That's one of the most uh, dangerous and horrible things that could happen to you. He took on g7 and now knight to d2. So I want to be as active as possible because right now my pieces feel a little bit off uh, side uh, in this game, so I try to create some threats. Namely, I want to play knight f1, giving a check to the skin and also uh, attacking this pawn. So if you take the h7 pawn, for example, I thought I have knight f1, the king can't really escape, can't, if, if you protect the pawn then I have knight h2 and you don't have any other move because the second rank is covered as just going back to g3 and then, well, at least I have a draw. And if you go back, then I have this move knight takes e3, uh, giving a check, 
attacking the g pawn and attacking the bishop, so I was pretty satisfied with this position as well. So that was my plan, but instead he got them, found the, the best move in this position, king to g4, and he is basically running here or here, trying to give me a checkmate. And that is, of course, the best thing that he has. I still play knight f1 because I still have to be as active as possible, otherwise if I just try to push this pawn and saying, I don't care what you want, I just want my queen to be promoted, then he would say, I don't care about your queen, I'm gonna just give you a checkmate. And that is what go what's gonna happen, because well, this pawn is far away from being promoted and checkmate is already coming, there is no way to stop it, so yeah, that is definitely the wrong direction to go. You always need to and uh, either calculate or just feel that your counterplay is good enough or not. So you always must to have some counterplay. If you are just defending, you can never basically win the game. In best case scenario, you would be able to deal with all of your opponent's threats, but it's also not that simple. But first of all, you are making it much more simpler for your opponent, because if you don't create any threats of your own, then your opponent doesn't need to think about it. He could just uh, focus on his own threats. And secondly, well, if you're not making active moves, you are never gonna win the game. So, I decided to, but, but like I said, this counterplay is just too slow, so I decided to, uh, to create another counterplay, which is activating my knight, giving sub checks, and attacking my opponent's uh, bishop. King f5, uh, king f5, knight takes e3, and now I was expecting king to f6. And then I was going to take here on um, and d5, I also have this rook takes g2 in this particular variation, but in general I wanted to take this bishop here and then push my e pawn. But what happened instead, he played king to e6 and saying that I don't care about your pawns, I just want to give you a checkmate straight away. And that was very scary, so I have to do something about it, I don't have any time to take the bishop because it's just a checkmate in one. So I played king f8, if you go to d8, that wouldn't be uh, great at all because, well, the king will just go to d6 and thanks to this bishop here there is basically no way to stop the checkmate. If you go to c8 it's still just a checkmate, if you go to e8 it's still rook j8 checkmate. I can take this pawn now, but then well, the rook will just sidestep and still the checkmate is unstoppable. So king should and must go to f8 to stop the checkmate. He took the pawn on h7, maybe rook f7 was another very interesting move here, because then he goes away to a7, creating some, some threats here, but still I have some time to maybe take this pawn and push my e pawn, which was my, was my main idea. He took on h7, and I did the same thing, I took here. Now, if you take with a king, then basically you don't have any passers, except for this h pawn, but it's not that dangerous and I, I still have time to take the g2 pawn and then push my, my b pawn, so black is definitely out of trouble because your king is also too far away from creating some checkmate threats. So he took with a pawn, and now this pawn is a huge danger, and the king is still very active here. But the drawback is now this e pawn is free to go, and that was my main, main hope, my main chance, so I just pushed my pawn immediately, thanks to the fact that, well, right now there are no checkmate threats. He played d6, so we both pushed our pawns to promote, and of course he is the first one, so I have to stop it, otherwise it, it's a checkmate in one threat. So I played rook d2 here, and the beauty of this position is that, well, white could promote the queen, no question about that. Rook h8, king g7, and now d8, queen, I have to take it, obviously, and then e2. And there is no way to stop this pawn, so even though white is a complete rook up, you can never stop this pawn because this king is blocking the e-file and otherwise you can never stop it from the side because d1 square is covered. And one check is available but the king will just go away and yeah, the, the pawn is going to be promoted here. So what happened instead after rook d2, he played king to f6 and at first I thought like I blundered it, I haven't seen it, so I'm gonna just lose here immediately. What What is going on here? But then I started to think and thought that, well, I'm not losing here at all. In fact, I'm winning here, and to win, to beat the Gotham Chess, ironically, I have to sacrifice my Rook. So I encourage you to find it, this beautiful sacrifice, because it's not that simple, not that obvious. So yeah, just feel free to pause this video and find the winning continuation.
Okay, I hope you managed to do it. So the right way is rook to d6 and I give a check first because once again I can't take it immediately. Just a checkmate in one is a problem. So I just need to push this king away first. And the idea is if the king goes like g5 or f5, then there are no even threats here because my rook is not under attack and I could just push my b pawn and there is basically no way to stop both of the pawns. And instead he played king to e5, which is the only very active move. Now I don't have time for b3, I don't have time for e2 because he's gonna take this guy and then d8 checkmate basically would be a problem. And so now I sacrifice my rook on d7 and the same thing happened if he takes. I just play e2 and you can never stop the spawn. Once again, the skin is in the center of the board, which is usually very great, but this time it just doesn't work. You can play king f6, which is uh, threatening a checkmate and rook e7, but I still can promote my queen and then block this uh, check here with the queen. And once you take, even though you, you're a pawn up, but you're not in time to stop this b pawn and it's gonna promote first, and you can't stop it with your king because it's not in a square. So, I took here on d7, sacrificing my rook, and Gotham said, well, what can I do? You are, you are mm, playing against me, like I would be uh, a big fan of playing, so I can not do anything against you. And so he gave some checks. He played here rook e8, trying to stop the last chance to stop the pawn. But the problem is, I just play the move king to f7, and now the rook is hanging. The only way to stay on the e-file is to play rook to e6, but, well, the easiest way to win, there are a lot of them, but just rook e7, making sure that the rooks are getting off the board, because otherwise I'm gonna just win the rook. And then the king is not in time to stop this pawn, go somewhere, just e2, and the pawn is going to be promoted. So, Instead, he just played rook h8 in the end of the day, but it's just wasting the tempo comparing to the position two moves ago. And now I just play e2, and once again, still there is no way. This rook is so passive, it, it, it's not gonna be able to, to stop this pawn on e2. And then, well, he gave a few checks, and I was like, come on, what are you doing here? Just resign, there is no way to stop the pawn, your checks are not gonna help you. And so, yeah, he just as you expect from the chessboard, he played till the checkmate, so with an extra queen, I'm especially strong, so I was happy to play this position. For some time, I have just pushed his king all the way, then I took his rook and finally gave him a checkmate. So that was the game. I mean, it seems to be incredible for me how passive I seemingly was at some point, all of the uh, pieces on the back rank, but it still was better for black. I mean, isn't that amazing? So I hope you enjoyed this game. And now, as promised in the beginning, let's go to the opportunity for you to win a completely free one-on-one, -on -one, one hour chess lesson with me. So to win a completely free one-on-one -on -one chess lesson with me, all you need to do is to be subscribed to this channel, hit the like button, although I can't really check it, but I just hope for your fairness, leave a comment, what's, what's your goal? Uh, in 2023 in chesses. And once there are 20 likes, I'm gonna randomly choose one of you and we are gonna have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, chess lesson where I'm gonna try to identify your main weaknesses and of course help you to deal with it. There are no obligations from your side, I'm just gonna uh, ask you to leave a feedback about our lesson so I could show that we really had this lesson because I want to be absolutely honest with you. So good luck with it and see you in the next video.